Now having talked about these first two verses and covering four different kinds of people, he spends from verse 3 all the way through verse 16, it's a whole column in my particular Bible of words, on one small group of people, the widows. If you remember all the way back in the book of Acts, the problem that the early church had, the, the Hebrew women were being treated well, and then there were another group of widows who were coming in from the foreign countries to spend their final years back in the nation of Israel. The widows who were coming from other parts of the empire were coming back to Israel, and the church wasn't prepared to handle all of these widows, and so there was an issue with them. It was part of their culture. See, if your husband had died and you were an older woman, you had no ability to make any money or to support yourself. And that's what Paul is going to address in these verses. Let me read just the first few verses and we'll kind of take a section at a time. Let me read verses 3 through 8 with you. Verses 3 through 8. Honor widows who are truly widows. But if a widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show godliness to their own household and to make some return to their parents, for this is pleasing in the sight of God. She who is truly a widow, left all alone, has set her hope on God and continues in supplications and prayers night and day. But she who is self-indulgent is dead even while she lives. Command these things as well, so that they may be without reproach. But if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse an unbeliever. So he has some very specific instructions as to who these women are and to how they should be treated. I remember my home church when I was growing up. We, we had a, and maybe it's the same in every culture, statistically men die before the wives do. And that was certainly true in my church. We, we had a, a row, we had pews in our church. And I remember there was a, a row of ladies who were the widows of our church. They would all sit together. They were wonderful women. They were godly women. And they loved the Lord and they served the Lord. But I remember how these women would sit together and how they would encourage her and how they would be a blessing to the church. These women were women of prayer. These women were women of faith. They loved Bible study. We had a, a Wednesday night Bible study and prayer meeting and they would faithfully come every week because they had time and they had opportunity to learn. But and I just recall how important that was in my own uh, formation of how I treated them and how important they were to the life of the church. Well, centuries ago when Paul writes this letter, they were present in those churches as well. And I would assume back then that maybe men died at an earlier age than, they, than the women did as a whole. So here are these women whose husbands have died and they're saying, what are we supposed to do? We don't have any means of support. Can the church help us? Should the church help us? So he says there in verse 3, he says, I want you to honor those who are truly widows. And you say, what do you mean, Paul? What do you mean by truly widows? Are there some widows who are not truly widows? And that's what he begins to explain. He says in verse 4, If a widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show godliness to their own household and to make some return to their parents, for this is pleasing in the sight of God. Timothy, he's saying this, If a woman's husband dies and she has children or she has grandchildren, let them take care of her that she might not have a means of making support or, or raising an income. But he says, Timothy, if she has family, when her children were born, she took care of them. Now it's their turn to take care of her. So Timothy, even though a woman in your church might be a widow, it's not automatic that the church is responsible to have to take care of her. But let them first learn to show godliness. And I found that, that to be a very interesting word. When the children take care of their parents, just as the parents one took care, once took care of the children, it is an example of godliness for everyone to see. That when we, and, and both of my parents are still alive, but the day is going to come when, if, if statistics are true, my father will probably pass away first. Well, I have one brother and I have two sisters. There are many grandchildren. I think we have 
4 or 12, we have 13 grandchildren in the family. That Paul would say to us, now, family, your father, your grandfather is gone. It is now your responsibility to look after your mother. And when you do, that is an example of your Christian faith. You live out your Christian faith by taking care of the responsibility and opportunity that God has given you. He says, to make some return to their parents, for this is pleasing in the sight of God. It pleases God, according to verse 4, when we treat them in this particular way. In verse 5, he says, She who is truly a widow, left all alone, has set her hope on God and continues in supplications and prayers night and day. Th this is a good woman. And this is what I was describing as those widows in my church when I was a little boy and a young man. You see, when these widows and their husband is gone and their children are grown, they have time. They have time to pray. They have time to be involved in the church. They have time to, to study God's Word. They have time to, to dig in deep and to, and to put their faith into practice. And Timothy, he says, you look at these women and you see in them this tremendous faith. They have set their hope on God. They continue in requests or supplications, in prayers day and night. We have this woman in our church right now. She's, um, she turned 90 years old, I believe. She's no longer able to take care of herself. She lives in a place that we call a nursing home. It's a residential care for elderly people who can't take care of themselves. She has problems with her legs. She can no longer walk, so she sits in a wheelchair or she stays in her room. But whenever I come to visit her, there's a big smile on her face. And I say, how are you, Marie? And she says, I'm doing well. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you for coming to visit me. And she's always so excited when I come to visit her. And the thing that interests me about her, I, I call her a prayer warrior. I think that the amount of time she spends in prayer is hours in a day. I, I don't recall seeing them the last time I visited her, but I remember in years past, I would come and, and on a little table she would have um, long cards of paper about this size. And all the way down was a list of names. And she didn't have one of these. She had, I think she had three of them. And on this was the names of uh, the pa me, the pastor, my family, her family, missionaries, people in our church, people in our community, and, and I think she had three long lists of people, and I think she prayed for most of them every day. Do you know what that means to me as a pastor to know that my name is on her list? Sometimes I, say, I, I would say to her, your work is as important to our church as if you were able to come and actually serve in a ministry in the church. Something like that I would say to her. And she would beam and smile. She says, well, you know, and, and sometimes uh, older people have a hard time sleeping at night. So if she would wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning, she wouldn't go, oh, I can't sleep. She would start praying for people. And I would say, what a godly example of a widow. When her husband died, I did her husband's funeral. And he was a very godly man, too. And she was sad that she was gone, but you know what she said about him? She said, he's so fortunate he got to go first. I can't wait till I can go and be with the Lord too. She just has this wonderful demeanor, this wonderful faith, even though her body is in pain. So when Paul writes a verse like this, she's truly a widow, left all alone, has set her hope on God, that's her. Continues in supplications and prayers, that's her. Night and day, that's her. But Paul says, you know what? There are a group of widows who don't have their husbands who are not like that, in verse 6. But she who is self-indulgent is dead even while she lives. There are some widows apparently in this church who, when Paul and Timothy observed their life, all they cared about was themselves. God's not fair. Nobody cares about me. I'm just going to take care of my own little money. I'm going to take care of my own little place, but I don't, I don't really care about anybody else because they don't really care about me either. That's a completely different attitude than what the first woman was described as being. He says, Timothy, the widows in your church who are self-indulgent, they're just dead. 
They're, they're alive physically, but they're dead in their heart. They're dead in their spirit. They're, they're dead in their Christian faith. He says in verse 7, Command these things as well, so that they may be without reproach. As a young man talking to an older woman, to go right up to her and say, Woman, you should not be acting this way. That would be hard. Because women have a, a, a gravity about them, a seriousness about them. He says, Paul says to Timothy, you go talk to them and you tell them that their priorities are in the wrong place. That they are focusing only on themselves and not on the glory and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they're not praying like they could. Look at the widows in your church who have this godliness. Contrast them with those who don't. And he says in verse 8, If anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. So he's talking to those people, who, the widows in his church, who have families who say, Oh, let the church take care of them. Paul says, if, they have fa if a widow has a family and they're not taking care of them, that's worse than being an unbeliever. They're missing their responsibility. So, he says in verse 9, how are we supposed to prepare them for service in the church? Verse 9. In fact, let me read through verse 16. Let a widow be enrolled if she is not less than 60 years of age, having been the wife of one husband, and having a reputation for good works. If she has brought up children, has shown hospitality, has washed the feet of the saints, has cared for the afflicted, has devoted herself to every good work, but refuse to enroll younger widows, for when their passions draw them away from Christ, they desire to marry, and so incur condemnation for having abandoned their former faith. Besides that, they learn to be idlers, going about from house to house, and not only idlers, but also gossips and busybodies, saying what they should not. So I would have younger widows marry, bear children, manage their households, and give, and give the adverse adversary no occasion for slander. For some have already strayed after Satan. If any believing woman has relatives who are widows, let her care for them. Let the church not be burdened so that it may care for those who are really widows. So there's two groups of widows that he's talking about. Those who don't have family to care for them, or the older ones, who don't have family to care for them, and the younger ones who simply should just get married. So let's look at the older ones first. He, he gives an age limit. He says they must be at least 60 years old. You say, why 60? As I told you, in that first century society, women were very low on the social order. There were very little respect. Most of the time, uneducated. So they didn't have careers like most of you have, or education like many of you have. They had been, they had married a husband who had a job or a career, and their life was attached to his. So he says, let the widow be not less than 60 years of age. So the husband dies, and if they're younger than 60, perhaps they have a chance to find work or to find help. But it was considered to be kind of at the end of their life if they're 60 years old. They probably didn't live as long as we do today. They might have lived longer. They might have lived shorter. And she's been the wife of one husband. It doesn't mean that she couldn't have had a husband who died and married again, but that her life showed that same kind of respectability that was talked about when we talked about the elders. The husband of one wife. Now here it says that she has been the wife of one husband that she has been faithful, that she has been loyal, that there's no attack against her. In fact, it says that she has a reputation for good works. So this is a woman who, when she was married and her children were growing up, and you saw her in church, you'd say, huh, I really appreciate her. She serves the Lord well. Her attitude is great. Uh, she does wonderful things for the Lord. It says next in verse 10, If she has brought up children, she has shown hospitality. So she's raised her children, she's invited guests into her home, has washed the feet of the saints, so she shows a humility, she's able to serve, and has cared for the afflicted, those who are the downcast and impoverished and endangered, and, and has devoted herself to every good work. So this is a marvelous woman. So here's what the early church did. They wanted to keep a list of this particular group of widows because they were such a strong asset to the church. You take a woman who, who has raised her family well, 
Her husband has died. She has a heart for godliness. She has a heart for service. Her reputation is known well. And Paul says to Timothy, Timothy, these women are like gold in your church because they can pray. They can serve. And Timothy, if they meet these qualifications, then you need to provide for their support so that they have their needs taken care of so that they can pray, so that they don't have to worry about where their next meal is going to come from or, or how there's going to be a roof over their head or, or clothes to wear. He says, I don't want them to have to worry about that because their gifts are so important to the church. We invite you to participate in the International Bible Teaching and Gospel Sharing Project. Whether these Christian expanded educational opportunities will become available to people around the world depends on all of us. We very much need and value your prayer and financial support. For more information, please visit www.tvseminary.com. I can't speak for your culture here, but I know that there's a certain limit in our Western culture where you get to a certain age where, where people look at you and say, you know, your time of service is over. Thank you very much. But, you know, honestly, we have the ideas now, we younger ones, and so thank you. Uh, you know, enjoy your retirement or enjoy the end of your life. Paul would say just the opposite. These women in these circumstances have much to offer your church. I want you to think about the churches in which you serve right now. I bet you're thinking of women just like this. That you know women in your church who are a valuable asset and a resource to you and that you can help provide for them so that they can be a, a blessing to your church. And I, I, when, I, when I read a passage of Scripture like this, my heart just warms because I can think of names, I can think of faces of women that I have known, women in my home church growing up and who now have gone on to be with the Lord where I say, what an example that they were. They didn't get bitter because God took their husband home. They instead came back to the church. They sat there and they studied and they would say, your message was so good or your teaching was so good. We're going to pray about this. And they did. But they must have had a problem because in verse 11 when he says, but refuse to enroll younger widows for when their passions draw them away from Christ, they desire to marry. Now it's not wrong to marry. But he says, if you take them and then your church provides financially for them and gives a place for them to stay, and you expect that they're going to be the prayer warriors of your church, and all of a sudden they're younger than 60 and their passions are still alive to get married, and all of a sudden they're trying to meet the, young, the, the men in the church and trying to look for a husband, he said, they're not going to be helpful to the ministry of your church. And they incur condemnation for having abandoned their former faith. They get so interested in finding a husband that they're not even living in godliness anymore. Verse 13, besides that, they learn to be idlers, going about from house to house, not only idlers, but also gossips and busybodies, saying what they should not. So their husband has died. They're not 60 years old. They have time on their hands, and they would go from one house to the other and say, what's the latest gossip? What did you hear about Joe or Sally or Pete? Oh, well, I heard this. Did you know that this? Oh, my goodness. And the conversation would go back. Oh, well, I'm going to tell that to her, but you have to keep this a secret. Okay, I'll keep it a secret. And as soon as you leave, they say, let me tell you the secret that I just heard. And then it would go from here to here to here. You would never do that, right? We don't think we would, but I love to hear secrets. And sometimes I go, I can't listen to that because I'm afraid that I might say it. But these women, because they were still younger and still of marriageable age, they would go from house to house. And Paul said, listen, they're damaging the ministry of your church. Don't put them on the roll. Don't put them on the list and support them. Help them get married. Go ahead and let them have families. So that's what verse 14. So I would have younger widows marry, bear children, manage their households, give the adversary no occasion for slander. Hey, Timothy, it's not that I don't care for these young widows, but their time of service, their time of having a family is not done. Timothy, I'm looking for this older group of women who have no family to take care of them. You take them on the church rolls because they will be such an asset to you. 
But if they're less than 60 or if they're 50 or if they're 40 and their husband dies in an accident, their heart is going to say, I want to marry again. That's okay. But if you try to make them something that they're not prepared to be, then they're going to do damage to the gospel witness. Remember what we say, for Paul, it's always about the gospel. It's always about the gospel. Timothy, if these situations are not controlled in your church, then the gospel witness of the churches in Ephesus are going to be damaged. Verse 16, if any believing woman has relatives who are widows, let her care for them. Let the church not be burdened so that it may care for those who are really widows. You could look at this whole section and say, wow, Paul, you're being pretty tough. You, sh you should show more love for these women who don't have husbands anymore. I think Paul is trying to be as wise as Solomon was and say, you know, we need people in the church who can serve with a dedicated heart and dedicated passion. And honestly, it's these oldest women who have no resources no opportunity for help, who can be the biggest asset to our church in prayer and in some service. He says, but if they're younger than that, get married, have children, manage your households, that's okay. But if you try to take these younger ones in and make them the prayer warriors and they're not ready for that, then your church is going to be in chaos and it's going to fall prey to these things that are happening. Now, what would be the application here? They say, well, my, my church doesn't really have that problem. In fact, even the woman that I referred to you, who's such a prayer warrior with the three different cards, she has two daughters that live in our town and two sons that come to visit regularly. We wouldn't take her on as an example in this case because she's provided for, but she's still a prayer warrior in our church. Why don't you think about the churches in which you serve and, and the churches in which you participate? Who are the neediest people? The neediest people can somehow and sometimes be the greatest asset to your church. You say, well, they can't teach Sunday school. They can't teach, they can't preach a sermon. They can't help serve any meals anymore. But can they pray? Sometimes we end up defining roles in the church so narrowly that say, if you can't do this, then you're not of assistance. I'm not going to tell you exactly what this means for your church. I have to take a passage like this and look at it in the context of my own church in which I serve and I say, who are those people that are needy that we must help because of the gospel opportunity they can be in our church? And then you ask yourself that same question. It might be the older widows. It might be somebody who, who comes from another town. You'll have to look at the particular circumstances. Maybe they come from another town and live with you and you find out they have no connection to the community or no connection to any family. Is that the kind of person? But you say, brother before or sister, before we can help you, we want to know what kind of role you can play in proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then we can work together to find out what that is and how we can help each other. That would be, I think, my admonition to you. So with the end of that section, we still have two more groups of people that Paul talks about to Timothy. But at this point, we'll take a break, and then we'll come back and look at one more of those groups yet today. So let's take a short break. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, 
Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300, or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift 